looking at the picture we had earlier here, and that was great. It's just a beautiful picture of Jesus sitting at a well uh, with the woman that I'll describe this morning. So would you turn to John's Gospel, Chapter 4. John's Gospel, Chapter 4. And we'll read all the way to verse 26. Hear God's inspired word. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the, the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come here to draw water. Jesus told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you, are, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. May God bless his word to us this morning. Some years ago, back in Montana, I, I went to a pastor's luncheon. And uh, this luncheon wa was to inform us about an upcoming event. You probably never heard of it back here in Indiana and in Illinois, but it was called uh, Montana, the Montana Awakening. And it was spread all over the this, this state. It was kind of like a, some sort of a crusade. And during our time together, one of the men gave a fitting devotion. And that devotion was from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John about a woman at a well. And I was so moved by, by that devotion uh, that I thought it was important for me to focus my attention on this very unlikely conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman 
And that conversation would ultimately change a town. Well, first of all, let's look at her region where she lived. The region where she lived. John says that Jesus and his disciples were baptizing more people than John the Baptist. And that meant that Jesus and his 12 disciples, they got a lot of attention from many folks, including Pharisees and Sadducees. Seeing that this was not the time for Jesus to suffer and die, Jesus led his disciples back to Galilee, Galilee to let things cool down in Jerusalem. And, and so at different times, Jesus did that because he was going to die not on the time chart of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but he was going to die on his own calendar, in his own way. In Jesus' day, there were at least three ways for a Jew from Judea to travel north to Galilee. And, and the one way is for them just to travel straight north as the crow flies and go right through the place called Samaria. That's one option. Uh, most Jews didn't follow, to, uh, didn't follow the, uh, that idea, and they didn't choose the road through Samaria because they had no love for the Samaritans. And I think many of the Samaritans, uh, they didn't have much affection either for the Jews. The second option, so some Jews, they took the route north by the highway that's called the, the Via Maris. And that's the road, that's the, it's the way of the sea, Via Maris. And so some took that way, going north and uh, avoiding Samaria. And finally, the other way to Galilee was called the King's Highway. And so people would go north from Judea, and then they would cut across the Jordan River and go north and uh, completely avoid Samaria and then go back on their journey north. Why was there such a dislike or even a hatred between the, the Jews? and the Samaritans. You know, we've got some of those rivalries today between the, the Jews and, and the Arabs and, uh, and, and other countries, uh, even between the, the Muslims, between the different Muslim sects, and they fight against each other. And why did these two groups of people dislike each other? Well, first of all, in 722 B.C., the northern ten tribes, they were taken into captivity. And uh, they, were, they were led by the Assyrians. And the only ones who were left in that area were the poor who farmed the land. And so they left them there. And, and the others were taken. A and then uh, they took other people from their empire, maybe Babylonia, and they placed some of those people in, in this area called Samaria, where the ten tribes w had been from. And uh, now those foreigners and those remaining Jews, they intermarried. And uh, one of the Bible commentators, Albert Barnes, some of you remember his Barnes notes on the, on the Bible. And uh, Albert said, some people referred to this new high, hybrid people as mongrel Dogs, mongrel dogs. Isn't that quite a description, a negative description uh, of those Samaritans? These people had a new religion, and it included both Judaism uh, and also paganism, and they kind of mixed it together. And I think sometimes even in our society, some of us, uh, we take Christianity and we take some some of the paganism of our culture, and we mix it together. We take some of these ideas. And instead of saying, well, what does the Bible have to say about this? You know, testing these ideas in our culture. The Samaritans only recognized the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament, that included the, the books of Moses, also known as the Pentateuch. <laughs> All this rubbed the Jews in Judea the wrong way. 
And, and then the, the Jews were taken captive in uh, 586. It was years later. And then it was the, peop the Jews who lived in Judea, below the ten tribes. They lived in Judea. And God had finally had it with them. And his prophets warned. And finally the prophets said, You're, God's going to take you and punish you and take you into captivity for 70 long years. And, and so this is what happened. And then when they returned, they wanted to rebuild the temple. Well, the Samaritans made a neighborly offer to help them in their quest. In Isaiah, or I should say Ezra 4, verses 1 through 3, we read that the Jews refused to let them help them rebuild the temple seemed like a good idea, you know, that they would help. They, they also had Jewish blood in them as well. So the Samaritans built their own temple they, the, because the Jews refused to let them participate. And the, the Samaritans built a temple there at Mount Gerizim in uh, Samaria. And these things attributed to a lot of bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritan people. The Bible tells us that in verse 4, he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. Was there something wrong that made those two highways, other highways, impassable? No. It was now the Father's will, his plan, for Jesus to minister to the Samaritan people. When he got to Samaria, he stopped near the, the town of Sychar. In the Old Testament, it was also known as Shechem. Maybe you've heard that, or heard that town name. But in, in our story in the New Testament, it was called Sychar, where the patriarch Jacob, he dug a well. And he later would give this property to his beloved son Joseph. Well, after traveling so far, Jesus and his disciples, they stopped. And the 12, they went into town to get something to eat. You know, here were, here were 12 men and Jesus, and they walked different places. They didn't ride. They walked, and they were outdoors, and uh, they were hungry. You got 12 men, and they need some food and refreshment, and they left Jesus at the well. The Bible tells us that Jesus was tired, and so he sat down by Jacob's well. Here we see G Jesus was fully human. He needed, he needed something to eat. He needed something to drink. He got tired, just like you and me, except he was without sin, like, like we, we are with sin, but he was without sin. And, uh, and so he understands our weakness to, weaknesses, too, that we have. He understands it. When you're dead tired, Jesus understands. When you have an illness that's dragging you down, he understands. You can be assured of that. And there it was probably at noon and that Jesus met a, a lone woman, and John describes her. And so here we see the background that she was a Samaritan woman, and now John describes her condition. This is her condition. She was a Samaritan. In verse 7, the woman came to draw well from the water from the well, and, and Jesus asked her for a drink. You think this was just by chance that Jesus asked her for a drink of water? I think Jesus knew this lady would be there. And he knew that he could start a conversation. You know, when you're, when you're talking with a neighbor or somebody at work, and sometimes there's just a natural connection when you just ask them a question. And then they start talking, and then you have an op opportunity just, just to give a little testimony uh, or, or who Jesus is or something about the Bible. And there are these natural connections in our conversations. And we need to pray about this even in the morning already before we leave our home. Uh, Lord, Give me a connection with somebody, at least one person in my life, that I can give them a word of, of testimony of who you are. So Jesus asked this lady for a drink. The woman was taken back by Jesus' request for a drink. You know, good Jews, they wouldn't 
eat or drink with Samaritans. In fact, uh, they wouldn't even drink from a utensil, from a, from a dipper or a jar from a Samaritan because they saw it as unclean. Gee, this woman, she was a woman. A, a good Jew wouldn't speak with a Samaritan woman. In fact, a good Jewish man, he wouldn't do what Jesus did because one of the rabbinical rules was this, and I quote, let no one talk with a woman in the street. No, not even his wife. That was the rabbinical rules. That's not biblical rules, rabbinical rules. Uh, not only was she a Samaritan, but the second strike was that she was a woman. She was probably a woman who was avoided. She was to be avoided. Notice she was out getting water at the hottest time of the day. You think it gets hot here. You go to Palestine, and it, it, it gets hot. Some of you have been there, I'm sure. And during the, during the noon uh, uh, in the day, or in the afternoon, uh, it gets very hot over, over there. And so she was getting water at the hottest time of the day. The other women had gotten their water hours ago during the cool of the morning. You see, they didn't want to be near this woman. She was one of the untouchables. They didn't want her to, to be around. You know, many years ago, the American author, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, he wrote a book called The Scarlet Letter. A and uh, this was a woman, uh, there was a woman, and uh, she had committed adultery. And so she was ostracized in her community. And she was commanded to wear a scarlet letter A in front of her. And so there was, a, there was like a necklace around her, and here was this scarlet letter to tell everybody that she had committed adultery. Aren't you glad that those days are behind? Uh, you know, but uh, that's the story of the scarlet letter. A and... Uh, you know, this woman, this Samaritan woman, she was also a marked woman in the community because of what she had done. Later, uh, we will know that this unnamed woman, that she had a checkered past. For over the years, she had been married to five different men. A and uh, she was now living with, uh, the man that she was living with wasn't her husband. How contemporary in, in our, our day and age. Uh, according to the Jewish law, this woman was living in sin, and she was to be shunned or av avoided. Jesus knew this woman had three strikes against her, but he chose to start a conversation with her that would change her life and the lives of the many people who lived in that town. How many of us would have avoided this woman? You know, probably if we lived back in that, those days, maybe we would have avoided her too. Let's be honest. Are, are there some people today that in your life that you avoid? There are probably, that probably so. Someone we, we choose not to share the good news with or to invite to church because the way they dress the way they act, or because of their past, or because of their skin color, or something else. Let's not, be, let's not prejudge them and, and, and avoid them, condemning them to an eternity without Jesus. Jesus told us to love our neighbor, and, and that we, should, we should do that. Let's love the unlovable, the shunned, the overlooked, those with a checkered past, the way Jesus loves them. Who are you going to invite to our next community dinner? You going to invite somebody that, who lives next door to you or a family member or somebody that you work with? Uh, are you going to invite somebody to our next community dinner? Or what about to a, a worship service on, on a Sunday morning to invite somebody to come with you? 
and then put put the icing on the cake, say, y y we would like to pick you up and have you go to Hammond Christian Reformed Church with us, and after the service, we'll take you out for lunch. Now, who could pass up a deal like that, you know? A and, uh, you know, and uh, here Jesus talked about living water and the bread of life and that, you know, we all think about food, don't we? Well, starting, uh, start thinking about it and praying about it. Don't you want to, them to experience the, the joy and the comfort that you know? Uh, because our sin, your sins are forgiven and you are accepted by, our, by our, your Lord. And if you're not, you know, then you need, some, need to do some, some repenting of your sins and ask Jesus to wash them away so that you, your, your soul might be whiter than snow. Well, we also look at her conversation with Jesus. Note her conversation with Jesus. Jesus simply asked this woman for a drink of water. That's a simple request, isn't it? And then Jesus told her that he could give her water, living water, so that if she would drink of that water, she would never thirst again. You know, you and I who live here in this area, uh, we don't have to work hard to get a drink of water. All we do is turn the, turn the t open the tap and get our glass and we drink or reach in the refri refrigerator and pick up a, 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 a bottled water and start drinking it. And uh, we don't have to work very hard. But in some of these countries, even today, uh, Usually it's woman's work, and so the women have to take their jars or whatever containers, uh, their five-gallon pails, and they have to go down to the river and get the water and then lug that water back up to their home and more than once a day. A and uh, think about that, uh, uh, some of you ladies. How would you like to carry a full five-gallon pail with water several times a day? That's work. And this woman, she knew it was work. Now that got, this got her attention, what Jesus said, because it was backbreaking work for her to walk to the well in the hot sun and then to lower this jar on the end of a rope. And those wells are deep. And that well probably was about at least 100 feet deep. Think about it, lowering that jar down and getting some water and then, you know, lifting it up by the rope and pulling it up. And that's, that's also work. It's tedious work. Uh, you know, she did that several times a day. And if Jesus would give her that kind of water, it surely would make her life a lot easier if she had some of this living water. She said, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come, keep coming to here to draw water. She was still thinking about H2O, water. But Jesus was offering her living water that would satisfy her eternal soul. Jesus told her, go call your husband and come back. And she honestly replied, she said, I have no husband. Well, you know, that was true, and yet in one way it wasn't so true. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you, are, uh, you now have is not your husband. Lady, you're right. First, she saw Jesus as a Jew, and now she saw him as a prophet because of what he told her about having, not having a husband. And then she would speak of the Messiah who would, would reveal all things. And Jesus told her that he said, I am the one. I am the Messiah. You're speaking to the, to the anointed one right now. The disciples came back with some food, and the woman hurried off, and she was in such a hurry. She was so excited that she had talked with Jesus. She left her water jars there by the well, and she ran into town. She was excited about what Jesus said, and I think she had uh, what some call a God moment. 
when she met Jesus. When she realized that the one she was speaking with was someone very special. He was the Messiah, the Christ. And later in verse 39 and 42, we read that, you know, what Paul Harvey would uh, call the rest of the story. We read about the people of her town, the people of her town, verse 39 through 42. You know, John wrote this, many of the Samaritans from town, they believed in him because of this woman's testimony. Now that's a miracle in itself, that they listened to this woman, this outcast, and they listened to her and they believed what she said. What a contrast with the people of Galilee who just followed Jesus because of the bread and, and the fish uh, he, that he fed them, or the people of Judea. They just wanted Jesus to do more miracles and more miracles. These Samaritans didn't ask for either a meal or a miracle. They just believed in this woman's testimony of who Jesus is. Isn't that amazing? We read that these Samaritans urged Jesus to stay with them. He actually stayed for two more days. He stayed there in, in Sychar. And many more became believers, we read, and they didn't just believe because of what she told them, but because of what they heard from them by themselves, they, what they heard from the lips of Jesus. They said, we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. No longer did they just see him a, as a Jew or as a prophet, or even the Messiah of the Jews, but they saw him as the Savior of the world. They claimed this man from Judea as their Savior. The Samaritan people, they came to know Jesus as their Savior by the, her testimony, and, and she led them, this unlikely woman, she led them to the Lord. You know, if, if Jesus could do that, don't you think he could use us to lead somebody to the Lord? I think so. I know so. When she came back from the well, uh, the, the people could have just shunned her or ridiculed her or stood in unbelief. But the woman at the well took that chance. She took the risk and she shared her faith and God used her faith and obedience to to start a revival in, in Samaria. You know, the fer it was the fervent prayers of Hannah. They were the answer that God gave her for a little son. And he would grow up to be a prophet. And his ministry would spark a revival in Israel. Many years later, here in America, God used the faithful prayers of a man in a reformed church in New York City. And his name was Jeremiah Lanfear. And uh, would, it would spark a, a whole series of prayer meetings throughout New York. In fact, uh, Horace Greeley, a newspaper man, remember he said, go west, young man? And he told his newspaper reporters, he said, tell me, report on how many people are going to those prayer meetings. And one of his men went from place to pay, place on his horse. And he, he said, I, I, I did all I could. And, and I counted 10,000 people in prayer meetings in, in New York. And so it grew and grew. And uh, maybe some of you heard about the revival known as the Great Awakening that would change our young nation. You know, if God could use the faith of an unnamed Samaritan woman to change a town, then God could use you and me, along with the power of the Holy Spirit, to change the people of this town, of this region here, the Calumet region in northwest Indiana. If only we had the compassion and the courage to, to love them, to pray for them, and, and to invite them to meet Jesus or to in, ask them to join us for a worship service. You know, that's what God wants us to do. We've seen the example of this Samaritan woman, 
and how she believed in Jesus and she was willing to be used by the Savior. May we follow her example and lead others to know Jesus as their Savior too. Amen. Our loving Father, use the story of this Samaritan woman to inspire us to know Jesus and, and the living water he so freely gives. Help us to know him as our Savior and to share his name and his salvation with the people of Indiana and with the people of the world. Lord, give us the love and the boldness and the obedience to invite those we rub shoulders with to come and, and meet the one who died and rose for those who are uh, the up and out and the down and out so that we might be saved and Jesus might be glorified. Amen.